Welcome back everyone for this second part of the tutorial. Um, in this second part, I've actually split things up into five parts because it basically consists of everything in regards to the sculpting stage, which obviously takes a lot of time. And um, before I get too lost in words, let's just dive into it. So what you're seeing on the screen right now is a Z-Sphere building method, basically. I'm building an armature so I can start sculpting on the character. Back in the days when there was no Dynamesh, Z-Spheres used to be the end-all be-all of ZBrush. And obviously, as we progress, things change. But I still find Z-Spheres very resourceful. Not only because you get to see straight away, without wasting too much time, the, um, the basic proportions of your character, but you also get, if you follow, the instructions that I'm that I'm giving you you'll also be able to get a very nice base mesh with even some nice topology um, to start off with uh, instead of using the the regular adaptive skin I go for the classic skin which you can find under the um, under the adaptive skin menu uh, you'll see me going over it in a couple of, uh, of minutes here. So it basically gives you a really rough, really rough mesh, a really rough initial mesh, I'd say, that you can then even further manipulate if you want to, let's say, have uh, straight away low poly mesh to adjust the initial forms and shapes of your character. Now, there isn't uh, much to say still at this first part as you can see I'm basically just building the the basic proportions or the features and placing them in the character using the, the Z spheres one thing I can advise you though is to use the draw size uh, to a minimum which is the value of one because sometimes um, it gets in the way the dynamic size or the size of the of the brush gets in the way I don't always remember that, but, you know, do as I say, don't do as I do. <laughs> it's a saying we have. So, I believe another thing I can tell you about the Z-Spheres is that you could, or you should, uh, initially draw the first Z-Sphere and then trace a straight chain or a straight line representing whichever part that you're building and then add additional spheres in it just makes your workflow easier just like I'm doing here with the arm so I've traced one directly from the shoulder to the elbow and now I'm going to do the same for the other one just so you can stay consistent with the size also if you press shift while clicking on the z-sphere you'll be able to create a z-sphere with the same size and remember to block out the, the major shapes first and then dive in to get the rest of the details like the fingers and, and um, other smaller elements that you might have. Obviously I, I did the, the fingers on, on, on the feet first before moving on to the arms because I've placed the major masses which were the, the torso, belly, etc. and uh, the legs. And then since I was working already on those limbs, I went on ahead and did the, the fingers as well. But you want to start off always, if you can, or if you remember, with the main shapes, just to have a rough sense and feel of the weight of the character, the form, the line of action, also if you put a little bit of posture in there. And I believe that's mostly it for this, um, for this initial part where I'm building the armature. I'll step in every now and then when I see that there's something um, good to say or reasonable to say that should be informative or enlightening to either the method that I'm using or as a technique tip or something that could help you when you're building your own. So sit back and enjoy the video.
So this is the part that I was telling you about a little bit early on. Instead of using just the regular adaptive skin method, I actually went on to the classical um, skinning method, which as you can see is a lot more rough, but is also a little bit more manageable in terms of using things like the move topological brush, which like you see on the screen allows you to pull individual polygons as they're really low right now and allow a better manipulation of the forms now these are just methods and techniques so pick up one that you enjoy and uh, work with it because what matters at the end of the day is the the end result so So even though I chose the classical uh, skinning method, I know that uh, I'll be using Dynamesh, so I didn't worry too much in terms of the manipul initial manipulation of the of the uh, of the proportions, uh, or should I say, the polygons that make up the proportions, because I know I'll be adjusting. I'm still using that classical skin here to get my initial shapes and uh, the, the things I want to work out into place. But since I'm going to use Dynamesh, uh, that wouldn't make much sense to me to be further refining all those shapes with the move topological brush. I just wanted to give you some options and show you a couple of different things that you might not know or be aware of. Now, this stage for me is also a lot about subtlety, meaning the mesh is still very low poly and even when I go into Dynamesh I won't go above something like 64 or 88 I think the maximum that I might go is the, the 128 resolution and that might be a bit too much so uh, the thing for me at this stage is subtlety meaning I'll be sketching in the major masses the bony landmarks, things like the clavicles, things like the kneecaps, the elbows and give shape and form to the muscle groups and all that by either using the inflate brush or going over with the clay, clay build up, damn standard, smoothing it all out. I think this is a time where I go into Dynamesh, exactly, and it's at 128. So what I mean by subtlety is I want to give the impression of the anatomy but I don't want to carve it too deeply or have it too... I think the right word might be popping out there's a lot of anatomy sculpts that I see that you see those really clear and defined lines that divide the anatomy I don't fancy that, I kinda like the subtlety of you looking at it almost like squinting your eyes and seeing, ah, okay, I see the tricep there, the bicep, the deltoids, the shoulders, the, you know, but it isn't very clear or very defined. It's just sitting there as it would on a normal picture that you would see in real life. So that's something that I always try to incorporate into my working method. So the basic thing would be going over with either move or move topological brush to get things into place, the major shapes, then going over them with the clay or clay build up, using them standard to carve in the lines or the joints or whichever connects one muscle to another or its cavity and then smoothing it all out. Then going back in again and doing it all over which means I'm building things in layers just like what happens in your body or you know just because we're building a whimsical creature here it doesn't mean that we don't have to either base ourselves in reality or at least give it a hint so that people can look at it and say oh, okay I see a little bit of 
some fantasy going on here, but it's still grounded in reality. It gives your design not only that appeal that you're looking for, but also a level of realism that is recognizable by your audience. So that's, at least for me, quite important. For things like the eyes here, I'm just using an insert sphere, and then um, I see I see the the eyelids a, a bit like, especially the lower one. I see the eyelids a little bit like um, how do you say those things? The cup as cups that hold the eyeball. So by using an insert sphere, then slicing half of it, or using masking, and then moving the half part of it closer to the center you get the resemblance of a cup right so then you can further manipulate it to look like an eyelid but the initial shape uh, that's what I focus on so you see me here carving in the geo and then I know that I'll be going over with the move brush to get the major volume into looking exactly how I want it to look then I'll be going over with a clay or clay build up to give it directionality and a little bit more of clarity in terms of shape of the muscle and then I know I'll be smoothing everything out just to give it a hint that there's anatomy there. I'm obviously building this creature based on at least two, three or even four, <clears throat> pardon me, different creatures and also human anatomy. I might be incorporating things like the exoskeleton of the of the wet lubber and the wings of the mayfly, a little bit of amphibians here and there, but I'm also building a lot of these things based on anatomy that exists, for example, in the human body. Even though his legs might be amphibian, as you would see in frogs and other amphibian-like creatures, and his hands by the two fingers in the composition might look a bit human but not so much so having a lot of reference to guide you through this whole step is a must-have I did change a little bit of the technique there I just added uh, a little bit of the trim dynamic to flatten some of the of the surface sometimes if you get a little bit of a lumpy volume in some of the things that you might be sculpting, try, and the smooth doesn't solve that, for example, try using the trim dynamic, as it should give you, it's an alternative method of, of smoothing things out that I like to use, so it might work out for you as well. I moved on to the hands because sometimes during certain sculpts that I make, I like to have a more or less cohesive um, overall completion uh, look to the to the sculpt and something I always put into my sculpts is expression in terms of both the posture and the smaller elements for example feet and hands are something that I love sculpting and I believe that give a lot of personality to the character even at this initial stage you know a more obviously riggers will hate you <laughs> but um, you know having that relaxed pose even during the initial stages of the sculpt really helps me uh, figuring out uh, some 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 elements that I might have missed during the initial concept or even during the storytelling you know you're it's always an um, a netting process you're you're basically you're not constraining yourself to your initial concept. You're always adding on top of that. You're just like building the sculpture itself or the painting or you're building things in layers. You're thinking in layers. You're thinking, okay, what is it that I can add here that will bring this closer to my intention? So I think now you can see clearly what I was telling you earlier about the building of the anatomy again in layers so that there's only a hint of the anatomy there but it's still clearly visible to the viewer I'm not taking it to to an extreme but I'm already showing a lot especially considered that we're at 90 something thousand uh, 97 something uh, 
thousand polygons, which is still very low base. Um, in terms of uh, polygons, but there's already enough there to inform you of what's going on with the sculpture. There's also another thing that, as you can see, is quite helpful, which is to hide the elements. Since we built everything in with polygroups, the Dynamesh actually retained those polygroups. So by shift, control, and then clicking on the part that has that polygroup, you'll be able to hide it. That can be quite helpful when you want to build things that by having the limb there or something there will obstruct your view and not let you sculpt in between. The chest of the creature, the, the whole torso area, uh, even though it will not be visible in the final image, was quite demanding in terms of solving. It reminds me a bit of that Mortal Kombat character, which I can't remember the name, which has not just him, but overall characters that have four arms are, uh, take a little bit of time to figuring out the whole anatomy because obviously the rib cage and the back muscles and the abdominal area is something that needs a little bit of thought process in, all, in order to, to solve. So I basically reduced a little bit of the rib cage in order to give room for the, for the arms to exist there. And as you can see, again, same method over and over again. I could have called it a day, but obviously by building things in layers and taking that little bit of extra time, you get a lot of the anatomy and the initial stage of the sculpt through so that you can later on not worry so much um, in terms of, it, of its completion by just giving a hint but you know taking that a little extra time to build things in layers you're already saving yourself a lot of time further down the road Right here is a great example of what I was telling you about hiding the, the selection and working individual, individually on the part that you want to focus on. Though I could, however, and this is a, a good tip for you if you wish to incorporate it in your workflow, I could have, since we're working with Dynamesh, just cut and copy the above set of arms. But, you know, Every opportunity that you get, especially working on personal projects, to practice a little bit more or to revisit those places or those features or whatever it is that you like doing and practice them, it won't hurt, right? So instead of just cutting and pasting and placing the set of arms that was already there, I tried to go over the anatomy again and who knows, I might step into a happy accident that makes me like this set of arms better than the upper one and then I'll use that technique, who knows, but be, be sure to experiment and take your time while you have it obviously, though sculpting 
for something that isn't personal, let's say a job that you might have as a freelance or something work related might require a specific workflow which doesn't allow you to practice or to take your time time with things where you know if you're doing whereas if you're doing a personal project and you can take that time I would advise you to take it and to make every opportunity that you have to practice a practice on practicing opportunity so just an advice Je vous ai vu tout à l'heure. Alors vous comprenez, le choc, l'émotion, le temps de me décider. Et vous étiez déjà loin. Alors 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 comme j'ai horreur de ce vivre, j'ai couru pour vous dépasser et précisément venir à votre rencontre. Et maintenant, je ne vous quitte plus. Dites-moi au moins quand je vous reverrai. Bientôt peut-être. C'est pour jamais avec le hasard. Oh, Paris est grand, mon cher. Paris est tout petit pour ce qui s'aime comme nous d'un aussi grand amour.
So finally getting close to an overall detail or anatomical detail, I should say, of the creature where I have set in place the bony landmarks and the major muscle groups, and even though they won't be visible, as I said, they're important to who knows, you might want to build another variation of this creature or even use it for other projects where you can just split it up and create insert meshes of the parts that you already did here and had, you know, your work and your time into them. Um, I like to then move on to building the accessories or at least blocking in things that relate to the concept and that's why I've I've put the concept up there to the left to to keep myself honest you know to okay now it's time to start blocking in the exoskeleton and to start blocking in maybe some of the other accessories that complement him and bring the storytelling into the play here so next part will be about using extracts off the main body so that the geometry is already in place and you can use it by just adjusting a couple of things and then using Dynamesh to better refine it and also appending primitives because I see the accessories and I see the things that I have to build in basic shapes first and then I move on to detailing them so next part will be all about extracts and appending meshes. So moving on to the accessories, his aviator hat or helmet, as you might want to call it, is one of the iconic parts of him. As you see, I'm just masking in the part of the head that I want to extract, and then by going to the extract menu, I can extract that part. Normally. I try not to give it too much thickness as I'm going to move into Dynamesh and also because I can adjust it by tracing the move line and then using the overall inflate. If you don't know it's quite useful by tracing the line then pressing ALT and right um, mouse button and moving that line you can build volume it's like an overall inflate to the mesh which can be quite useful and now I'm just using Dynamesh to start since it's already in place to start blocking in or at least refining a little bit of the shapes that I want to and this is basically the main method that I'll be using to create all the accessories except maybe for some that I might find useful or easier to kind of just append a primitive object as in a cube, a sphere or a cylinder and start along with Dynamesh building the shape of the object. So if you look closely everything around you is built or made of simple geometry I mean simple basic shapes the triangle the cube the cylinder even the most complex shape can be broken down into a more simple one so have that in mind every time that you're thinking of building something either in Dynamesh or Maya or whichever application you might use think small you know think I mean think big to small think um, basic first and detail after. 
After all, a big problem is nothing but the sum of smaller problems. So if you start solving those smaller problems first, you'll end up solving your big problem. So that's at least how I try to think. Another very, very useful tip I can give you is, and I can't stress this enough, save your work. I just simply lost count on how many times throughout this project ZBrush has crashed or stopped working and I had to redo a couple of things. Now the autosave feature is sometimes a lifesaver and sometimes a living hell. And I'll tell you why. If you have complex big scenes where your character, which isn't the case here, but could be, your character is already, I don't know, 10 million polys or whatever, that autosave feature can make ZBrush crash. Uh, now, I do believe it will be solved when the 64-bit version comes to the market, but until then, you know, if you're not using the autosave feature because you might fear it, that it will crush ZBrush, do at least save your project often. Another thing that I use constantly is the mirror and weld function under the modify topology tab on geometry. Just because when you're doing cuts like I'm doing here, it can get uh, messy really fast. So if you just do them on one side and then mirror the thing that you're doing over, it just saves a lot of time as well. Also, when you extract something, remember to put up symmetry again by pressing X, because by default when you do an extract, it doesn't, um, it doesn't put it up automatically. So you might want to remember that. Also, as you can see, I'm using the um, polish feature within the Dynamesh function as for me when i start blocking in shapes it just helps me to visualize those plane breaks those plane changes a little bit better so that's another useful tip that i can give you here Having lost the work that I did to the helmet before, to the head, the aviator head, actually made me follow a different workflow here. Like you saw, I just extracted the mesh yet again, like I did the first time, but now I'm appending the cylinders, because those goggles that he has in his head are basically just two cylinders, one on top of the other, one bigger than the other and those patches on the side are just cubes so that's basically what I'll what I'll be doing here and I believe throughout most of the rest of the accessories which is appending a primitive or by using the insert mesh brush primitive also and then working on with that also when you insert your first your first um, mesh onto a Dynamesh um, model or object 
if you then by using the move line the transpose move line if you press control and drag it it will create a copy of that same mesh that you just inserted so that could be useful like you saw me doing there to create the inner or outer structure of something that you might be building in my case the goggles I had that outer ring before the the glassy part so that's what I did I just duplicated that initial insert mesh and then rescaled it to fit my intention Another thing I have to tell you is that even though in the initial reference sheet there were no references to an aviator hat, along the way throughout the project it's advisable that even though you sketched in the initial concept or that you might have an idea of what you're building, it's good to collect additional references and have them either on a separate monitor or somewhere easily accessible so that when you're building something even though you're just concepting and sketching in and let it evolve not constricting too much or constraining I'd say too much to your own concepts it's good to have additional reference for that I just used the insert strap brush to have that connection in the goggles there and also I appended a cube for that side strap of the side wing, I don't know the, the exact name of, of the hat and now I'm just adjusting the eyelids to better fit the shape of the eye sockets there and involve the, the eye itself.
another thing that I like to do when I sculpt the eyes is the iris, the inner part of the eye. For that, I, I use a really simple technique. If you select the move brush and then reduce the focal shift, which basically means the, the fall off of the brush basically, and push in the, the iris, it's going to give that sculpt effect to it, which is quite nice. Then if you duplicate that initial eyeball and set the BPR render to transparent, it gives it that gloss specular effect that the eye has. So it's a quite a nice effect to have while you're sculpting, um, even though in, in this initial stage, which is if you have the you know if you have the mesh, the overall detail and completion of the mesh to the same level, I believe that it just becomes a bit more appealing for you to work on it as well. Because if you focus too much on one area, and you'll see me do that the opposite actually throughout the entire sculpt which is you know I don't focus too much on one area I actually move around the sculpt as much as I can not only to stay motivated with it but also to see the overall progression take the same level of of, um, of complete of completeness let's put it that way it's just more just more motivating to work this way
So after appending a simple sphere and then shaping it into the form or shape or structure of that exoskeleton, that body exoskeleton part, I, I had my references on my other monitor, but so that you can have a look at what it is that I'm taking reference from, I actually cho I actually imported the the wet lubber and the other references that I have for that exoskeleton, which as you can see is based on layers and brought it into ZBrush for you to have a look. Now I just wanted a little bit of surface detail because I wanted to see how it works or worked with the character. So I just loaded in a freckled alpha and I think it's alpha 28 and scattered a little bit of detail over the surface to have it that crustaceous kind of kind of look and then I've also used a really nice feature for the move brush which is the Yaku curve which allows you to basically pull out these really really um, nice thorns out of any surface so that's another thing that I did for the overall look of that initial shell and I'm also extracting what is uh, considered in the wet lover to be a moving part that allows the wings to spread so I believe I'll be moving on to the rest of the exoskeleton next which is the the arm structures as well as blocking in the wings just so that we can have an overall feel of how the character will look in this initial stage.
Now that we have the character in a more or less blocked in stage, I'm also using the curve brush to, um, to trace the mayfly or what you can see in the mayfly's tail that I've and will adapt to this character as an extension of the tail that will illuminate, which is basically another inspiration taken from another bug which is the firefly. So our creature here is a combination of human elements because of the anatomy, some of the anatomy, which kind of relates to the amphibians as well, like the legs and arms and things like that. Also the wet lover, the mayfly, the firefly, and the ladybug. I felt that the legs were um, a little bit too small so I'm just adjusting before moving on to the accessories some overall anatomy and also a little bit of uh, fine-tuning to um, to the exoskeleton itself as I noticed that there were some flaws with some of its parts so over the next um, couple of videos which come just right after this one we'll be discussing a little bit of the building of the accessories again using the same methods either appending dynameshing and then sculpting them into what their shape represents in real life or by the extraction method